Have you ever wondered how long it actually takes to make a wheel? The evolution of a design from start to finish can vary as far as the timetable, but what's interesting is how many iterations sometimes it takes to get to the final product. We've never really had the ability to go back and give you a full documentation of what that looked like and include a timeline. So today we're gonna to do that. We're gonna tell you how the Mark I came to be and how it got here all of its steps, all of its stages, and how long it actually took. first things we're trying to do is we're trying to come up with a look and feel. Um, not a look and feel what the wheel's gonna look like when it's complete, but almost like a genre, just to make sure that we're all on the same page. We typically look at a lot of our wheels in our wheel line and we try to have a vision of what we're hoping to accomplish, whether it be a void or we're trying to go into a different direction styling-wise. These are all things that we're trying to consider. Additionally, we're trying to consider what the actual use is and who this wheel is gonna actually be for. Now, the good news is a lot of that information and inspiration actually comes from feedback that we hear from you. So all those comments and feedback that you provide, whether you send in a direct message or you put it into a comment on a wheel, we read every one of them and we do make notes, especially when we're starting to have sort of design conversations. So the first thing we got into when we started to talk about the Mark I was, all right, who is this gonna be for? Now, Koenig has become known for a lot of performance-oriented product, and we wanna keep bringing that into different phases because out there in the wheel segment, you have a lot of people that have a lot of different tastes. And for those that have been watching along for quite a while, you'll know that I refer to this as the ice cream flavor theory. And basically what that is, is there's a tremendous amount of flavors of different style ice creams. It doesn't mean that everybody's gonna like every one, but it doesn't mean that ice cream's still not good. Something to that effect. So when we got into doing this wheel, we wanted to be able to go a little bit more stylistic approach, go a little bit away from all the aspect of making sure we're cutting every ounce and every, every available little piece of weight that's not needed from the design and just focus on the aesthetics but also produce a wheel that had the Flowform technology that we're known for in it, and also had some cool accessories while being able to get this job done. And that's what the Mark I ended up doing. But how we got there is a whole other story. So the first thing we do when we start to draw any design is we obviously, we're not gonna worry about the technical specifications. We're gonna go for pure aesthetics. And that's why when you look at the earlier stages of design, you'll notice that the, some things look more aesthetically pleasing, but in actuality, we're not necessarily gonna be able to make them like that because when we start to factor in things like load rating and FEA, and maybe even the PCD range that we're gonna look for, this may change the design look and feel. And it's more often than not that when we develop a wheel, those are the things that as we start to add in to a finalized design, we realize we don't like the design as much anymore. And that can take a lot of time going back and forth. But looking at this first iteration, you can see what we were trying to do is kind of have that very angled 45 degree lip uh, look. And we wanted to also put that into a mesh. So we wanted to provide a wheel that actually had a decent lip size, but also had kind of something unique in the sense of you know, combining something that looks really elegant as far as the, um, the mesh portion, but also has the ability to have this like really crazy thick machine flange. So that's what we were going for. All right, so we're kind of climbing into the second change that we started to make here. Now, right away, we're trying to work in those logos like we spoke about on the lip. You could see here, we had this idea to do flow formed and kind of put an indent uh, that kind of would run in a semi around to try to give the uh, that, that flange a little bit of style, but also try to create a little bit of uniqueness to the design. Additionally, the one thing we've realized by creating this big 45 degree angle on the lip is this thing is going to be heavy because we know that the center, if you look, the spokes themselves are much thinner at this point. Now, if this was a forge wheel, you might achieve that, but with a, a flow form wheel or a traditional cast wheel, you're just never gonna get that. The, 
the FEA is going to determine that these spokes are too thin, especially where it touches the barrel, and they're most likely going to end up having to be much thicker than they appear, which is going to change the whole look of this wheel. So, all right, so the third iteration, actually, I'm looking at the timestamp and the date stamp for some of these files, and uh, this is uh, June 21st. So June 21st, 2023, you could see now the one thing that you could see that's majorly changed in the third iteration is that major 45 degree angle thick lip thing is now gone. Now, the hard part is this, is that we all wanted to keep it. We love the look of it and we thought it looked super badass. The issue that we ran into with keeping it was the weight. The weight was astronomical. It was just so much material in that lip and that's so off-putting for us. Even making a wheel that's necessarily gonna be heavier, like the finished Mark I, you could see in this stage in an 18 uh, by nine. Uh, this wheel itself weighs about 22 and a half pounds. So it's heavier than almost every flow form wheel that we have on the market, but it's also a tremendous amount lighter than a lot of competitors' wheels that are trying to play in that same space. So I think that we ultimately ended up doing it a great bit of justice, but this is where the decision was made to trim the fat in a with a with a basically a cleaver. And we we cut that lip away and we said, look, if we're gonna do it like this, we can't do it with that big lip. It's so off-brand for us, and it would just be a heavy wheel. So the other thing about this iteration that you could see is the PCD area is actually now much deeper, and this is because we know that we're gonna do a covered lug design, and we also know that at this stage, we need to be able to make sure that we have enough hub depth for a lot of the cars that are gonna have bigger hubs. And the only way to really get this is by creating distance where the cap snout will actually be up far enough where when the cover plate is down, we can actually bring that PCD and that whole center section forward and create that extra hub depth that's gonna be found inside the center board. So here you see, We've now created the depth that's in that center bore. That's where the lugs will go to hide. Uh, cover plate will go on top of it. Um, and now we have realized that we're going a little bit more in the traditional sense. So what has made its appearance for the first time is actually putting in a plastic pop-in hard logo that we developed. Um, and we are now going to be adding that as we go forward. And you can see on the finished Mark One, that's exactly what's in here. You can actually remove this it's totally up to you if you want, and you can kind of go into a center cap that's threaded on the wheel and doesn't have this if you want to just take it out. But um, it is totally something that we added and we realized most people are going to probably expect this. We're going to go with it. All right, so we're moving into our fourth iteration, and there's going to be one thing that you're going to notice right off the bat, and that is that the lip is essentially gone. Now, there's a couple reasons we made this decision. One was we were able to increase the structural rigidity of the wheel and start to decrease some of the weight that was in there uh, just by moving the spokes to the outside of the face and going with a more face forward design. Now this tends to happen because when a spoke is just inherently straighter, we're able to get some more structure out of it, right? So um, that structure is gonna allow us to maybe uh, be able to cut some weight back from some other areas. All right, so let's get into the fifth uh, iteration here. Um, this brings us right to the end of July. This is now July 31st. And the interesting thing about July 31st is we are now finally entering, ending up to that point where we're saying, all right, the nod to a little bit of that retro needs to be to create a more um, rounded fillet that is going to be on the outer edge of the lip here. Now a fillet is essentially uh, just basically a radius and so we basically increased the radius so that we got more of a smooth look uh, as it transitioned into the two steps of that flange. So the first one out here, the second one right here, um, and then there's like almost a, a, a flange that happens right here uh, where the drop center flange would, would be. Obviously the drop center is a little bit behind that, but that's a whole other story. The other thing you could see that happened in the fifth iteration right before we kind of sent this thing off to R&D to try to have all the finalized uh, FEA done was we started to think about how do we want this valve hole to be? You know, when you have a flange that comes to the outer edge here, 
you know, that's roughly what ends up being a, a difficult thing. So we ended up creating this cool little pocket. Uh, I like it very much um, and it, I think it blends in with the style just perfectly. And it allows that valve stem hole to not really be obtrusive, but also kind of flow with the design. So um, that's in there now. And I think we have everything we need to be able to now get it to R&D, let them do all the FEA from start to uh, finish and be able to uh, decide if it's time to go and start opening up molds and developing tooling. So right when we get to that point where we made sure that the, the area can be drilled for the proper uh, fitments, we're also gonna wanna make sure that now we're starting to plug all those brakes in for those cars and the intended fitments that we want and make sure we have enough brake caliber clearance. This actually takes quite a bit. So this wheel, again, done as you see it, right around the end of July, July 31st, according to the date stamps on some of these files, but it's gonna end up being almost another month and a half before we get to a point where we've checked all the different uh, vehicles that we want and we've gotten this design set, finish, run initial FEA to know that we are right in the ballpark for everything and we're about to send this thing off. So now we're right at the end of August, right at the first date of uh, September and this wheel is now getting pushed off to decide if we're able to go for tooling. So here comes the finalized steps. All right, so molds are in production and we are coming in on the deadline for SEMA for this wheel to actually make it. We need to come up with the important thing so we can get some samples built and so we can test for production. So we settled in on this hypercarbon as a finish. Now this is a new finish for us. It's like the hyperchrome, but it has an element of black or smoke to it. So this is more of like a smoky type of hyper paint. Um, and that kind of gives it a little bit darker than the hyperchrome, but it's lighter than it would get to some sort of really dark gray. Now being a hyper paint, it's super reflective. Being reflective, the cool thing about this is that it has a lot of depth to it, which means if you have a lot of light, it's gonna to appear to be a lighter wheel. When the wheel starts to get darker, it's gonna to appear to be darker. And that almost can come off like a smoked chrome. So you can see as this thing moves across the different light waves here, it's gonna take on different tones and darknesses and, and stuff like that. And that's part of the beauty of doing a hyper finish like this. But now we know what finish it's gonna be. We know which accessories we're gonna need and we are fighting to make sure that we're getting the accessories built and we're also being able to test this wheel for production. Soon as wheels come out of the mold, it's not enough that we did FEA. We now need to subject this wheel to a tremendous amount of testing physically in real life to be able to make sure that this is structurally intact and matches every single thing that we simulated. If it doesn't, Right there, the mold goes back for modification to ensure that we are making sure that we change every single piece of the design to add the strength we need or to be able to modify something in a way so it behaves exactly like we simulated. So right at the end of this month, you should start seeing these wheels hit the shelves. So if you're looking for them, this is a good time to place that back order. If this is later than that, well, then they should all be ready for you to be able to approach. But I hope that this gives you an insight to how long it really takes to do a wheel design, uh, what kind of changes and different things we make, what kind of accessories, what kind of planning goes into it. If you have any other questions, throw them down below. I'll always be happy to answer them the best I can. There's always a lot of intricacies and nuances that happen when we build wheels and some smaller decisions that obviously I may not be able to get into, nor would I be able to really remember all those details without being asked, but um, we'll try to give you that information. I hope you found this helpful. I mean, we tried to answer everything that I could think of in the process of this design. If you have any other questions, if not, we'll catch you in the next one.